Okay, so today we are joined by um, Dr. Caldwell, who is a neuroscientist and faculty in the UCLA School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. So thank you for coming um, to our meeting today. And if you'd like to start by just telling us about uh, your professional journey through from undergrad through your current position and then an introduction to your current research. Okay, well, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk a little bit about the research that we do. Um, I'm actually the, the vice chair of the neuroscience program. So you may encounter me in one form or another. I'm, I'm the, the person that reads everyone's um, research proposals for the 199 and 198 <laughs> programs. But I, um, I started doing my, um, my research um, in, in circadian rhythms when, um, when I was my, a freshman. Um, so I was a freshman at Vanderbilt University and um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, um, but I had um, to earn some money. I took a job at, at the science library where my, my, my function, which you know, you'll laugh about because I'm um, sure no one does this anymore, but um, my job was to shelve books. So I, um, I went and I would shelve the books that people would return. Um, that used to be how people did research. And so I had to shelve the books and I kept, you know, when I would have some downtime, I would, um, of course, read um, what was there. And I kept coming back to um, the, 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 the QP section of the, um, of the library, which was um, at that point, the, the, I guess it was biopsychology, neuroscience, but it was before neuroscience. And um, we're talking and I was really fascinated about the how the nervous system controls behavior and and that really um, and then particularly in circadian rhythms these endogenous clocks that we have inside us even though all of it was interesting to me you know I, I had this sense that um, that that I could solve the problem about circadian rhythms it seemed more manageable than cognition or even learning and memory. We didn't have an anatomical locus, but at the time when I was a student, the, the central circadian clock in our brain was just identified in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And so I, and you could take those cells out, put them in a dish, and they would continue to show daily rhythms just sitting in a dish. So I said, ah, that's something I could figure out, you know, because it was like I could put my hands on it. And so the, um, so after after you know coming to that decision, the, the the hard part was convincing any of the faculty to take me on as a student. And so I took I took a, a fair amount of you know, I was a freshman and no one really wanted to have a freshman in the lab. Um, but but finally I did find um, a guy who who studied circadian rhythms who was interested in developing a, a laboratory for undergraduates. And so I became his um, test subject as I would, you know, he would see whether I could do the experiments or not. <laughs> and, so, and, and I actually became, um, they, they didn't have a neuroscience uh, major at the time. So I was, I'm actually the first neuroscience major at Vanderbilt because I did, they had an interdisciplinary a mechanism to do interdisciplinary studies, um, which I, I took advantage of and, and, and chose to do neuroscience there. So, um, with, so with that, I, I went on to do um, my um, my PhD at University of Virginia, um, which at the time had the strongest circadian rhythms biological timing center in the um, in, in in the world. Actually, it, it's kind of fun because the person I was working with there um, is your current chancellor, Gene Block, um, was was my mentor as a student. Um, there um, when he was much younger <laughs> now um, and then and then I, I I got a job here my my um, my well I did a postdoc and got a job here at UCLA in the in, in the 90s and I've I just love it here and I've been here ever since um, and so I've been active I've been um, part of the um, undergraduate neuroscience I, I'm one of the people that have been on the executive committee in the um, 
the curriculum committee for since the 90s actually <laughs> you know for for this and I've, I've i teach um two courses here to um neuroscience students um one which is going on right now is is a course in circadian rhythms which is my specialty and then um in addition in the um in the fall quarter we along with um two of my friends gina poe and katima paul we, um, we we teach a course in sleep um, the neurobiology of sleep so um, both so I you know if you're interested in the topic I can recommend all those I don't re recognize any of the names here so I don't think any of you have taken but if if you did I apologize <laughs> it's hard on zoom to learn everyone's name but um, anyhow um, so is that is that good? Do you have questions about the background? That's all, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. So if you want to go into your research, that would be really great. Okay. Well, don't worry. It's going to be research light, um, given it's it's late at night. So, but but let's see. Let's see if I can share my screen. <clears throat> all right. So. What, what I thought I would do today, and, and you know, just feel free to, you know, to stop me or whatever as we go go through this, because I'm happy to take questions or, um, but what, what I thought that I would do is, is spend like 10 minutes just introducing you to the field of circadian rhythms. Okay, what it is that, that we study in, in, the, in the broadest sense. Okay, and, and we could stop right there. Okay, if that's enough, you know, on 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 an evening, um, I'm fine with that. But but if you are interested, I could also take you through one of our recent areas of study, which is using um, circadian um, based interventions to treat um, Huntington's disease, and in, in this case, a mouse model of Huntington's disease which would be another 10 minutes. So you guys can decide. So we'll do the first general introduction and, and then, then I'll pause, you know, and you could just say, oh yeah, that was great. See you, see you next year. <laughs> and then I'm cool with that. So um, anyway, so, but just, this is just like, so this is just general knowledge about circadian rhythms, you know, which again, that's my whole career has been on circadian rhythms. So it is stuff that I, um, that I do, that I do love. Um, and, and, and just so you know what the heck I'm talking about, um, circadian rhythms are endogenous rhythms, meaning they're generated from inside your body, okay? Um, their, their cycle length is close to, but not equal to 24 hours. That's how they get the name circa meaning about and D and day. So these are rhythms that repeat with a frequency of about 24 hours. And the, the rhythm that you're most familiar with, of course, is your sleep-wake cycle, yeah? Um, but, but pretty much everything in your body um, from transcription of genes to cellular processes to the system level organization to of course our behavior is regulated by this timing system. Um, it's synchronized by light. So one of the powerful ways that we have um, to, to keep a regular sleep-wake cycle is to expose yourself to light in the day and then avoid it at night. And I'll go through that in a minute, but um, I'll mention that, that UCLA students are notorious for having terrible sleep-wake cycles, um, probably in most cases due to um, inappropriate light exposure. But anyway, that's maybe another story. Th this timing system is genetically determined, and we know a ton about the molecular genetic underpinnings. And you'll be delighted to know I'm just going to share one or two slides on that because there's that most of the field works on on that part of, of, of it right now. And, and so this is my cartoon version of work that I should mention just gave three people a Nobel Prize in medicine to working this out initially in Drosophila. Um, so so this is so you just this is my attempts at animation. So I apologize if it's very poor because I'm not a graphic designer, but this was just a prototypical cell, okay, with a nucleus and, and cytoplasm. So this can be any neuron, but, but one of the things about the circadian timing system, it could also be your hepatocytes, you know, it could be your cardiomyocytes, any cell essentially has this timing system inside it. Um, and at the beginning of the cycle, 
So here we have um, a couple of elements, clock and BMOL, binding a specific site in the DNA known as an E-box that's in the promoter region, which turns on the expression of um, a number of genes, including these period genes, the per genes, and the cryptochrome genes, right? So you, you remember, and it's not too painful, mRNA starts being produced, right? Which then gets translated into proteins out in the cytoplasm. The proteins dimerize, and these dimers accumulate over the course of several hours. And what they do then at around dusk is they translocate back into the nucleus where they inhibit the, 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 initiate, the, the transcription by binding clock and BMOL and moving it away from the DNA. So that feedback loop, it's a negative feedback loop. So you've all experienced this in one way or another, negative feedback loops, but this is occurring inside all the cells in your body, okay? So, so pretty much all your cells have this timing system in operation inside them. So again, it, it starts at dawn with the transcription of the period genes and the cryptochrome genes. Dimers accumulate in the cytoplasm. Then at dusk, lights off, they move into the nucleus where they turn off their own transcription. Okay, and of course, there's a lot more to that. And we have mutations in animals and we have mutations in humans. Maybe some of you are mutants actually. What that would, if you have a mutation in this timing system, you would um, see um, Simon over there is laughing. He's, he could be one, he could be the light, one of the mutants. So, so, so what that would mean is someone who, you know, all of us, you know, at your age, your midpoint of sleep is around five in the morning. And so if you get eight hours of sleep, you would normally, you know, go to bed at one and sleep till nine. That's the normal cycle at your age group. Um, but some of you will not be going to bed till near dawn, okay? And some of you will be going to bed earlier. And, and that's driven, okay, by this timing system and mutations in the timing system, um, among other things. Anyway, let me see here, what's going on? Ah, okay, so we know another cool story. So that, that work, figuring that out is thousands of papers and three Nobel prizes. Okay, but another story which uh, I think we'll ultimately develop a similar appreciation for is the discovery of a new light detection system that feeds into this clock. So when I was your age, I, I believed that we would not discover new senses in humans, but clearly wrong, because one of the things that we've come to appreciate is we have a light detection system, which is in our retina, but does not hook into the visual system at all. Okay, it goes straight to the hypothalamus and to control circadian rhythms and mood actually as well. Um, there's a novel photopigment, so you guys have all studied rods and cones, but there's a novel photopigment called melanopsin, um, which is localized not in rods and cones, but in retinal ganglion cells, about eight to 10% of our retinal ganglion cells. These things are direct photoreceptors this is a picture here of a primate retina. So you can see the cell body and the dendritic processes. Any of you who took vision or have had vision would know these are terrible at detecting um, a visual response because look at the processes. You couldn't tell if the pho photon was hitting you know, one part of the retina versus the other with these things. These are great light detectors. They're, they're terrible for vision and they're not connected to the visual system at all. Okay, they don't go to the lateral geniculate. They don't go to the V1 visual cortex or any of that. They go straight to your hypothalamus. They're sensitive to blue-green wavelengths of light. And so this system is designed to synchronize to blue sky, essentially. So they, they, they're, they're activated by dawn and, and then they turn off at the end of the day when, when you know, we're in the dark. Um, the, of course, the easiest way to screw this up is to expose yourself to blue-green wavelength light during the night, okay, or to avoid its exposure during the day. So any of you who are video gamers or spend a lot of time on your computers at night, you're basically inverting your light-dark cycle as far as the circadian system is concerned. And, and so, of course, you're going to, you know, sleep in the day and not at the night. Um, so those, those, that, that, 
light detection system, blue-green sensitive photoreceptors, as I mentioned, does not project to the visual system. Where it does project, it's the center of my universe, as, as people in the lab like to tease me, um, which is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN for short. Here's a picture of it over here from a mouse. The cells that are receiving the, the light information are, are actually um, shown in green, and the center of the, the nucleus is shown in red. These are defined by different peptides, which you know we don't have to worry about tonight. But we know a lot about this circuit um, and, 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 and how it works, which, which of course, we're not going to describe today. But, but light information goes directly there. OK, there's a direct not monosynaptic projection from the retina to the hypothalamus. These, this is the central clock cells of our body. If you lesion the cells, you lose your daily rhythm um, and, and all these different parameters. Um, and what do they regulate? Well, they regulate all the neuromodulators that you've studied in other classes, things like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, histamine um, are all rhythmically regulated. It's also a neurosecretory cell population. So it's dumping a bunch of hormones into your brain that we don't actually know what the heck they're doing right now. But they also regulate hormones that we do know what they're doing. Things like um, your stress hormone cortisol has a very high, beautiful rhythm um, where the cortisol peaks in the morning before you wake up. And, and me, for me, waking up is not my happy time. And so I understand why stress hormones go up before you wake up in the morning. But, but mechanistically, what it's doing is that it's setting your body, getting it prepared to wake up for the day. And, and conversely, um, before you go to bed at night, another hormone, melatonin, is being secreted. So melatonin goes up at night before bed. And is what prepares your body for sleep. So cortisol wakes you up, and the melatonin puts you to sleep. And then it also regulates the autonomic nervous system for any of you who may be interested in cardiovascular function or something like that, non-neuro, neuro outputs. <clears throat> okay, and, and just a couple more points in this introduction. Um, one is that, and I, I told you this before, but just to reiterate this, so we, that these molecular clockwork is found in all your major organ systems. Okay, so your liver, your, the islets and your pancreas, your lungs, your heart, all have their own timing system, okay? So these molecular clocks are normally synchronized by your brain in, in the cells in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, okay? It's only the brain that gets the light information in mammals. In Drosophila, actually, all these different cell populations get their own light information. But in us, it, this light information goes to, from these melanopsin retinal ganglion cells directly to the SCN, which then regulates the um, HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and the autonomic nervous system to regulate the timing of all these different organ systems. Um, and, and so you can imagine, I'll just you know mention that you can already imagine probably just looking at this organization, this network, um, what happens when you screw up the timing in the SCN is that so you do you know by inappropriate light exposure or you know just by traveling not that we could travel right now but you know when we could travel you know a trip to the europe or a trip to asia would would completely disrupt this scn clock for a few days <clears throat> and so all these different organ systems go out of whack with each other okay normally everything has to be synchronized in time so the, you know the before you would have your meal come in, the liver is already preparing for this. The islets in the pancreas are preparing for this. You know, the the lungs and the heart are, are timed to to regulate, to be ready for the activity during the day. And, and, you know, so the molecular clock is actually controlling the expression of, of, of a large pool of genes. Um, and, and basically, you know, they what they do is they time, it's timed so that optimal performance occurs during our day and during the night is when the bodies the cells use that time for repair repair function so if you're looking at gene expression involved in repair you'd see it would peak during sleep time if you're looking at gene expression involved in like energy production or something like this or secretion in the brain it would peak during during the day when we're active 
okay? So that's the basic circadian timing system. Questions? I have a sort of question just about the like uh, blue green light, right? That's the yeah sort of how what, what effect is there if that's kind of like if you expose that yourself to that like most of the day? Because <laughs> I think a lot of people could also relate. That's kind of how the last you know months of COVID have sort of been. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. So the one of the things which is intriguing to me is that fluorescent lighting does not activate the system. If you look at the wavelengths um, that are emitted by fluorescent light, there's very little activation of the blue green wavelengths. So what that means, if you're spending your day inside under fluorescent lighting, your, your timing system is saying it's nighttime and you're gonna get sleepy and you're gonna have a hard time staying awake. And if you're spending your nights in front of a TV or a computer monitor that's emitting blue-green wavelength light, then your, your clock is saying, oh, it's daytime. You should be awake. Your brain will wake up under that conditions. And quickly, you will find that you are unable to sleep at night and you have a very hard time staying awake during the day. Does that ring a bell to anyone? <laughs> Yeah, that definitely explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so the, you know these things are pretty easy to. Um, oh, okay, so glasses. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's always a, there's especially gamers love to because they want to stay up at night, but they don't necessarily want to have their sleep wake cycle screwed up. So so it is one of the things you can absolutely do is to use goggles that that block the um, blue-green wavelengths. Um, also, of course, there's software um, in your, many of your um, computer products that, that can manipulate the spectral output. Um, we actually tried that a number of years ago with a group of UCLA students um, to see if it made any difference, and, and, and it did. So using the software which blocks the um, blue-green wavelength light led to about a 30-minute earlier bedtime for the UCLA students who used it, as opposed to those that didn't. So, you know, that's that's probably about right, and I think that's the kind of thing you would get from the the, the goggles too, the blue light goggles. Now, my world, my 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 future is that we're all, you know, I think we're all going to shift away from these fluorescent lights, which are a disaster, to LED lighting. And um, LED lighting can be tuned. Um, I'm working with several companies. In fact, you can tune it so that you can expose yourself to the blue-green wavelength during the day and um, avoid it at night. Because, of course, you can still see without blue-green wavelength light. Um, you know, you can shift it to the red and the orange, and and so you can see, but um, but without this inappropriate stimulation of this arousal system. Um, because I, you know, again, I, I probably went over it quickly, but the the circadian timing system in the SCN is directly linked through neural pathways to all the major um, regulatory elements within your brain that control arousal. So, you know, when, you know, things like dopamine, okay, which, you know, are high when we're aroused, high during the day and low at night. Um, things like norepinephrine, okay, um, things like serotonin are all rhythmic. They're, it, the, the levels of those neuromodulators are rhythmically secreted. Um, so, and, and that's all under control of this timing system. Um, another question. So kind of, would you say light is um, basically the biggest external factor uh, controlling our circadian rhythms or are there any other sort of factors? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, so so light is, is the most universal um, signal used. Um, so if, if you think about it, there's few things you can count on in this world, except for a dawn is going to follow night, right? 
and, and, and night is going to follow day. So for organisms living in the real world, it, it's a very reliable and noise-free indicator of time. So pretty much all animals have used it, but there's a secondary system which can also be very important and is active in us as well, which is our stomach. When we eat is another important regulator. So one of the things that we found, and it would certainly be true for all of you, is if the pizza guy shows up in your apartment at four o'clock every morning, okay, and delivers pizza or whatever your preferred food is, tacos or whatever, okay, your favorite junk food, okay, what you would find is that inevitably you would wake up about a half an hour before the delivery of the food, okay, because it's a very powerful signal. So light is the dominant cue, but the second is the important cue is the timing of when we eat. And it's one of the things we've been working on with um, Alzheimer's um, and neurodegenerative disorders because the light input gets compromised um, in, in the patients and um, in the mouse models too, for that matter. And so we, we've been trying to use the timing of, um, of feeding as a secondary cue. It doesn't reset the clock in the brain, but it does reset the clock in your in you know in the liver and the pancreas, um, in your gut. So it 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 it's a powerful cue, um, as well. Um, yeah. So so number one is light. Number two is the timing of when we eat. We've also um, used exercise. So if you if you're in a regular pattern of exercising. Um, actually, it's really cool. Your your muscles, because they have their own clock, right? So so the muscles will will sync to the timing of exercise, and and so you will get better performance out of your muscles if 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 you're you know working at working out or or doing your athletic performance at the same time of day, and you'll get worse performance if you disrupt that that basic rhythm. I have a question and I guess I'll try my best to, to word it, but I'd like to know if you found somewhat of a critical threshold of how much light it would take to significantly affect the um, circadian rhythms or is it is it kind of like a linear relationship of how much light significantly yeah. affects it? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I thought you were going to ask about the clock mutants. Oh. <laughs> uh, because we do find them in people too, but but anyway, the no, that's a great question. So yes, there there within a range, there is a linear function between the um, amount of light that that you get and 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 the response of the system. Just like the visual system, it's just that it this requires much more light in general. But just to give you a sense of it, one of the things that we've been um, exploring. Um, so so kids that are autistic and have other neurodevelopmental disorders, um, they spend more time um, playing video games at night than, than age match controls. Um, you know, probably because they're not sleeping, their sleep is disturbed, but also maybe because of lack of social interactions. So there's a, there's a lot of time spent in front of um, a computer screen. And the so, so we've been modeling that in mouse models of autism. And, and what we found is that even a very dim light, like the sort that would be emitted from your computer screen at night, or, or a night light for that matter, um, depresses the amplitude of the circadian timing system. And actually for mouse models of autism, it makes the, um, the, the, the symptoms worse. Um, so, for example, the repetitive behavior, which is one aspect of autism that we also see in the mouse models, is, is, is particularly sensitive to that um, inappropriate light exposure. So we've been looking at that and trying to figure out the mechanisms. We think what's happening, but, but this is still active research. We think what's happening is that light at night is actually increasing inflammation pathways. So um, one of the pathways regulated by the circadian timing system is um, inflammatory responses through the NF-kappa B pathway, which if you haven't studied it yet, don't worry about it. But if you had studied it, you know, then you'll recognize the name because it controls um, the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in our, 
in our body. And if you disrupt your sleep-wake cycle, you disrupt this pathway biochemically and you dis you, you, it leads to inflammation throughout your body. We see that in the mouse models as well. And we think that's what's going on to drive the increase in repetitive behaviors um, in the, um, in the, in the mouse models. And of course, that's something we want to look at in, in the patient populations as well. So dim light, five lux, we'll, we'll do it. So night light, computer screen. All right, other questions? Um, I have a question. Hmm. So I hear a lot about um, people being either like early birds or night owls. Um, and so I sometimes think that I'm a night owl because I like being awake at night, but uh, it's kind of hard to tell whether it's just like an influence of like the world we live in and the schedule we have to adapt to. So is there a way to like figure out which one of the two you are, and does that look just like um, not respecting that um, natural character? Is that like very unhealthy? Yeah, 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 yeah. We there's a lot of data on that, so that's really interesting. So, so, so first off, so the 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 human cycle length is genetically determined. Some of you, most of you, are going to have a cycle length which is longer. Um, and what that means is you, that your natural rhythm when you're in an LD cycle, when you're in the light dark cycle, is that you will stay up later and then sleep later. And, and you could tell that about yourself on, on your free days. We always look at a, how the person is sleeping, not when they have to go to work, but what do you do on the weekends um, or you know times that you don't have a schedule, um, non-scheduled days, I guess. Um, and, and, and if you like to stay up late and sleep late, then you're a late chronotype, okay, um, under those conditions. Some of you, usually about 10% of the population, are annoying morning types. And, you know, my, I, my dad was that way, so I know that it's a thing. And, and, like, he would get up, you know, at 5 in the morning every morning, and then, you know, he'd already be giving me detailed lists of all the things that I was supposed to do, you know, by 6 in the morning. Like that's super annoying, okay. But but about ten percent of you are that, you know, future surgeons, by the way. Um, but anyhow, the um, so so these things are very real, and actually we can take a skin sample from you, and I could measure your endogenous cycle length, you know, based on the skin, because this molecular clock is found in fibroblasts as well, and it predicts pretty closely whether you would be a morning person or an evening person. Um, it does change with age. So um, any of you who've lived with grandparents would know there's a natural shift with aging to, to um, change the cycle length, um, which it shortens with age. And um, so it's literally true that time goes faster as you get older. And, and, and it'll naturally translate then to going to bed early and waking up early. It's a natural pattern of humans. Um, it's actually, I'll just as a little aside, um, one of my colleagues took cells from young people and old people, grew them in culture, measured the rhythms, and showed these differences that I'm describing. So younger people had a longer cycle length than older people, just their cells, okay? This is just their cells. And then he actually took the, um, the culture medium, the serum from young people, and he put it on the old cells. And, and the cells then expressed the longer rhythm. And he did the converse experiment, and he took the the serum from from you know, older people and put it on the young cells, and they they showed the, um, the the faster rhythm. And so there's something in our in our blood that that is also influencing these age changes. And there's been a lot of work with mass spec and things, and it turns out there's thousands of rhythmic uh, molecules in our blood. So we really don't know what it is yet. But it's just a little tidbit that's kind of cool. It's, um, you know, you could take, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that rich people aren't already doing it. They probably are actually doing blood transfusions from young people. And you, you, you could actually shift the circadian clock. Um, so you guys, you know, you have to watch out for, you know, rich old people. Because, you know, besides taking your money, they'll also try to take your blood. 
<laughs> you know, as soon as they figure that out. But I'm not telling, don't worry. <laughs> oh yeah, let's see. The other part of your question was, okay, are there, yes. So typically we find with evening types, so, you know, typical for your age group, there's a, there's, um, a consistent insomnia during the work week um, because, you know, classes usually start at like eight in the morning, which is really inhuman for someone whose midpoint of sleep is five. So, you know, basically cultures around the world have sleep deprived teenagers for decades now. And so we're all looking at the experiment of, of doing that. Um, it, and, and, and there's a number of ill effects that you get from chronic sleep deprivation. Um, and, and I think if you look around in the world, um, whether, you know, whether it's Europe or, you know, the, the US or Asia, you're seeing these effects of chronic sleep deprivation in the population. So a number of the public health um, changes that we see, just take something like type 2 diabetes. I could turn any of you into a type 2 diabetic after about a week in the lab. Um, so that's how fast, just by disrupting your sleep-wake cycle. I could, because the pancreas and the islet cells that secrete insulin um, are, are very rhythmic. And if you disrupt the sleep-wake cycle, you disrupt their ability to secrete insulin in response to glucose, and, and it, it dysregulates your blood glucose. So luckily it would go away, but I, I literally could turn any of you into a type two diabetic very quickly, um, just by screwing around with you in the lab. Not that I would do that, of course, but, but, but it's not then a surprise that if we're sleep depriving young people across the world, um, that type two diabetes is going up like crazy, right? There's a lot of other things too. All right, anything else you got for me? I have a quick uh, little side question. Is it possible for someone to be both types? Because I have a friend that goes to bed at like 1 a.m. and then wakes up at 6 a.m. without fail and he like feels good all the time. Like yeah. he just is fine with five hours of sleep. <laughs> It, it's it's highly unusual, but there are there are some individuals that there, it's like a bell shaped curve, okay. And and the mean of the bell shaped curve is at about seven and a half hours, but there are um, and and actually also mutants. We we know some of the mutations that lead to short sleeping, um, but anyhow, the there there are some people that can get by with five or six hours, but that's extremely rare. That's extremely rare. Most people need seven to eight hours. And even people that get less, you know, if they're given the opportunity on their free days, will will sleep more and their performance, we can actually measure in the lab the performance improvement by allowing more sleep. I mean, it's especially for vigilance tasks, um, cognition. Those are very lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> what you should be doing that on the pandemic you don't have eight o'clock classes anymore right is everything is recorded only about half my class now shows up <laughs> i don't know what they're doing <clears throat> anyhow i digress you have any any other questions for me i have a question about melatonin supplements that yep. i know a lot of college students take like do these have any like long-term effects on your circadian rhythm or like? Yeah, I, I mean, melatonin generally is, 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 is a hormone produced by your body. It's high during the night and low during the day. Um, people that um, with age, that's one of the rhythms which is disrupted. Um, also people working funny shifts um, have, you know, disruptions in melatonin. And so a low dose of melatonin as a supplement before bed can be beneficial. Um, we found about a third of the, the people respond well to it. And, and, and that's by low dose, I mean um, around um, usually, usually like 0.5 milligrams um, is, is sufficient for those that respond to it. About a third of the people say it makes no difference whatsoever. And about a third of the people say they, the, the complaint they get is they get more vivid dreams. Um, and some people find that disturbing, but, but it's, there's no negative consequences that anyone has seen. It, it's your body. The only thing you'd have to worry about is if the, the drug company that was making it 
you know, had some contaminant in it. Like melatonin itself is very safe, um, safe, safe, you know, and, and, and for about a third of the people, it'll help. Okay, someone's asking about a higher dose. Well, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, you can take, if you want the melatonin to um, produce a hypnotic effect, in other words, make you acutely sleepy, then you usually have to move into like the five milligram range. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, like a sleeping pill-like effect, then, then, then you do need a higher dosage of it. I, again, I haven't seen any people reporting problems for um, even, even that kind of dosage. And they sell it, they sell it in five and 10 mill, they, three, five and 10, I think for at the health food stores. Um, but, but again, if, if you find benefits to it, most people can really dial that down. And, and I guess in general, I'd recommend it, you know, using as low a dose as you can to get the benefits you want for any, any of these supplements, you know, just cause who knows, you know, just in case there's something else that's in there because of poor quality control and manufacturing. Okay, so that's really interesting. So I have a question, actually. One, you mentioned a bunch of like public health issues that have come up in the recent decades because of how our society is working nowadays. Yep. And like one of those, especially for like people always talk about how like depression and anxiety disorders are rising. We're not sure whether they're rising just because of like the higher rates of diagnosing them or whether they're really rising, but it seems that there's a lot of literature that talked about the relationship with, of that with circadian rhythms. And you also just like mentioned inflammation right now, which is also another thing that people suspect have relationships to these mental health disorders. So what is your take on that? Yeah, well, the, the inflammation is um, linked with disruption of, of the sleep-wake cycle is very clear. So mm -hmm. that that's like, that's that's a done deal. We know that. We know the pathway, we know the mechanisms by which that's working. Um, so that, that for sure. The, we, we also, the, the anxiety component of it, we're, I think we're still working on. I, I'm, I'm involved in a study right now looking at Tourette's syndrome, you know, and, and the patients also. So that's like a tick disorder, um, repetitive behavior. The patients also suffer from anxiety. And we, we did, so one of the treatments that we just tried, it's a small group, it was just a pilot study, but we, we did it on about 20 patients where we use the blue light exposure in the morning to enhance their, um, their entrainment. And, and the, indeed they, they did report um, lower anxiety and, and they shifted the melatonin rhythm. Um, you know, so we we're able to document that. Uh, you know, weirdly though, unfortunately, the sleep for those patients did not improve. So we we're, it was kind of a, a mixed bag for us in that study. Um, although the, you know, so there was clearly a link with anxiety that we were able to, to tr treat in a sense by treating the circadian disruption. Um, in the animal models, I think it's pretty clear that we can make um, certainly an animal anxious by disrupting the sleep wake cycle. And I mean, don't you think yourself, I mean, don't you feel like, like on the days when you're not getting enough sleep, maybe you're studying for midterms or finals or whatever, right? I mean, don't you feel that way? You feel a little, you know, anxious, like you're just not, you know, things aren't working well. And I don't know, I, I think it's a pretty common feeling, even if we don't quite understand all the mechanisms underlying it at this point. Thank you. It's really interesting to hear about how all these different hypotheses for psychiatric disorders can come together here. Yeah, I mean, so I work in psychiatry. Yeah, so, you know, we, um, and I think in most cases, what you would say, so all the patients with psychiatric disorders that come into the hospital, I mean, almost like 90% of them are showing disruptions in their sleep-wake cycle. Okay, so it's extremely common, almost universal um, phenotype. So, so that's very clear. What we don't know is, um, is the part which is more interesting to me is can we then treat the patients by improving their sleep-wake cycle? 
like, is this something that we can treat? You know, can can we apply, you know, you know, maybe melatonin, you know, or or, or the lighting conditions and, and optimize a person's health? I, I would say that that's where, that's what we're working on right now with animal models mostly, um, because we need to understand the mechanisms before we could design the human studies. But, 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 but there are, there's also some of the beginnings of human studies as well, especially looking at the um, scheduled feeding protocols, which is something that improves the circadian system. And there's a lot of interest. I think there's about 30 clinical trials right now going on using that for type two diabetes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Anything else or have I exhausted you? I can go on forever. I think there's a question in the chat box. Oh, I'm not looking at that. Someone's asking, how does not getting enough sleep affect the immune system? Mona asked that. Okay. Yeah, so the one of the key regulators of immune function is this NF-kappa B pathway. And so this is con what controls the levels of um, a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines, maybe things you've heard about like IL-6, TNF-alpha. Um, there's a whole bunch of these cytokines that are circulating in inside our bodies that are rhythmic. And um, when you disrupt the sleep-wake cycle, um, either genetically, which we can do in animals, um, or through environmental perturbations, like what you do to yourselves when you stay up all night studying, um, you disrupt the regulation of this NF-kappa B pathway. And the result of that is your, 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 the inflammatory markers in your blood, like IL-6 or like TNF-alpha will go up under those conditions. So transiently going up is okay. It's probably protecting you from infections during this time. Chronically though, um, chronic high levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines makes you susceptible to um, infection. And so we see that a lot um, actually among UCLA students during the midterms and finals. Um, when there's a usually a period of, you know, five plus days of not getting enough sleep. And I can't tell you there, I mean, there's this beautiful rhythm that you can see in terms of um, people getting colds and, and, and flu, um, you know, that, that that's, directly, I think, related to the, their, their, their sleeping patterns. And we can see that in the lab. We can do it in the lab and we can see it in, in, in the population of, of, you know, students among others, <laughs> factory workers, you know. So the, these are all pretty well established um, relationships. Um, and we know the mechanisms underlying it, you know, at least in the mice we can you know, we can do all the transgenic animals and do the manipulations. Okay, I think we're at 650. So maybe we can take like one more one or two more questions. Yeah, 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 sure. Oh, it looks like there was one in the chat. It says why is sleep necessary to avoid these detrimental? Effects? Yeah. Well, I I think there's two things going on, um, but from from my point of view, the I mean, so so sleep itself is has restorative function, right? And then and and so there's benefits of sleep um, in in sort of inflammation and reducing inflammation, and you can show that very clearly that as you start allowing people to sleep more, their inflammation goes down. And in fact, um, in people, those of you who aren't getting enough sleep because maybe you're, you're studying or partying or whatever the heck you're doing at night, um, a short afternoon nap can bring the levels of your inflammatory pathways back down to normal. The trick is that it has to be short. So a long nap in the afternoon is a disaster. And I can guarantee you that by the end of the year, we always see um, a number of um, UCLA students in the sleep clinic because they've managed to completely invert their sleep-wake cycle. 
where the afternoon nap gets longer and longer, and then they can't sleep at night. And so then they, they, they're, they're completely inverted, okay, in terms of their sleep-wake pattern. But, but on, a, on an easier level, just, just literally the inflammation goes up when you're not getting enough sleep, say five hours is not enough, okay? So um, cortisol goes up and inflammatory pathways go up. A short nap in the afternoon will bring them back down to, to regular levels. Mechanistically, we understand best how the circadian system, the, the, those clock genes that I showed you are directly tied to regulation of these biochemical pathways that control inflammation. So when you have the normal rhythm, you have normal levels of inflammation. And, and as you disrupt the circadian timing system, you, you disrupt um, the levels of those pathways. So um, we, we know a lot about the mechanisms, but it's um, on a practical level, um, this is one of the few things that you can do to modify your inflammatory state, right? When, you, when you're staying up partying or studying or whatever the heck you do, you, you increase inflammation and by getting enough sleep, you dampen it down again. So this is something that's under your control one way or the other. And let's Okay, segmented sleeping. Ah, yes, okay, sleep fragmentation is, is very disruptive in most cases and not having a couple, you know, most people wake up at least once during the night, um, but, but a regular pattern of, of wakening up is what we see in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients. Um, we see it with aging, um, should not be part of the sleep profile for a young, healthy person. Um, and so the sleep fragmentation, this, you know, not being able to sleep through the night is definitely disruptive um, to all the same pathways that I just mentioned. Okay. Yeah, uh, I guess to tie it off, just like sort of like a final question, uh, if you have any sort of advice for any of us that are interested in pursuing a PhD in neuroscience and maybe how does, um, you know, the field of neuroscience research kind of compared us some adjacent research fields when it comes to pursuing a PhD? Yeah, the, um, I mean, okay, you're going to have to invite me back for the, for that. That's a longer conversation, but I'll, I'll, I'll give, you know, some, so, so I, I, I have been, I mean, I've always been my whole since I was an undergraduate, okay, I was interested at in the interface between clinical work and and basic research, right? So the the PhD, you know, clinicians, MDs, don't have any time to do any research, essentially, with with a few exceptions, the financial pressures and the you know time is money sort of logic means that the MD is is great for clinical work, but it's not good for doing you know, research, you know, and, you know, there's some exceptions and we have them in my department in psychiatry, right? It's a clinical department, but by and large, that's, there's the division, the researchers are done by PhDs. Okay. So if you're interested in doing the research side, then, then, then the PhD is the path. If you're interested in seeing the patients, then the MD is the path, right? And, and, you know, a few people, there's a few MD PhDs that are in between, right? So that's more or less it. Um, the, the best advice that I have for undergraduates interested in, in, in pursuing a neuroscience PhD is to get involved in research as, as, as much as you can. And I know that right now this sucks, okay? It sucks for all of you, it sucks for me too, okay? This time of COVID has just been a disaster. Um, you know, I can't have any students in my lab. I, I have eight undergraduates that work with me, I, but I can't have any more, you know, because, you know, I, I mean, I got them in before, but now we can't get at anyone and all the labs are in the same situation. Um, so I'm hoping by the summer that's going to loose, loosen up. But right now, um, you know, we're in a situation. But on the other hand, I have to say, looking through the 199s, I was really impressed with the students, all of your ingenuity in coming up with projects that, that involved um, not being in the lab. 
I was amazed that, you know, and I was very generous. I mean, anything that sounded reasonable, I just said, okay, fine, you know, but because I know it's so hard right now, but it is possible because um, I saw, I, I went through, it's like a hundred research proposals this, this quarter. So, you know, it is possible um, to find research projects and labs that are remote, but it's clearly, it's, it's not as good. You know, and, and, you know, my, I mean, I, I have a, my youngest daughter is 21 and she's going through this too. She wanted to enter a master's program and, you know, they, they, they canceled the program, right? Because they're, you know, it's all remote. It didn't make any sense. So, I mean, it's just hopefully just this year, but, but it's, you know, getting involved in research is the main thing. Like I don't even, when I, when I look for the, the potential graduate students, um, I don't even look at grades. I don't even care, you know. I mean, sometimes the straight A students are not the ones that are good in the lab, right? You want someone that's done research and and has an appreciation for it. It's a different thing, you know. It's um, because you could be great at, you know, it's like it's like being the artist versus being the art critic, right? You can be a great art critic and not know how to paint, but but if you're going to paint, and that's what we do in terms of doing research, you know, then then you have to have time in the lab to do it. So I just, that's the thing. I know it's hard right now, but I would just, um, you know, argue that the best thing you can do is start doing research, getting as much exposure as possible. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, okay. Everyone really enjoyed your talk, so thank you. Thanks, yeah, you can invite me back and I'll tell you the second part of the story. <laughs> We would love to have you back. Okay. I mean, I feel like we could have gone all night. Like people yeah. continue to ask yeah. questions in the chat. I have plenty of my own circadian rhythm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, well, yeah. Invite me back, and I'll do the. I'll, I'll tell you the story. This was the intro, but I could tell you some of the work that we're doing to to show that we can environmentally manipulate the circadian timing system and improve health. Okay, wow. mostly in animals still, but we're you know we're moving into people too. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Bye. We'll stay in touch.